for all of our moms out there today and wives, God bless you. And I pray that that uh, is the song uh, that your husband also would sing to you or certainly would say to you today. Would you take the word and open it to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1. You'll find that in the Old Testament. And uh, we're going to take a look today at a mom that uh, her name means favored or favored by God. Her name is Hannah. But uh, as I was thinking about this message and on the message of Take Me Home Country Roads and talking about mom, I was asking myself, I wonder if our culture, if our culture didn't have the Word of God, how would we get a picture of what a mother really is or what a mother should be? Well, obviously, many of us would, and many of the world gets a picture of what our family should be by watching our television, by watching media. And I was thinking about that as I was working on this message, and I thought, in my own lifetime, I have seen the the picture of motherhood change from what television has said time and time again. For instance, the first mom I ever remember was June Cleaver of Leave it to Beaver. And uh, I remember her, and I remember, oh, she was, a, she was like a perfect mother, and I mean, it was great. It was a real shock to my own life when I got married, and the first day I walked into the kitchen, I expected Cynthia to be fully dressed in hose or hair done and pearls while she fixed my bacon and eggs. And so, uh, <laughs> that was my picture of mom. But, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have certainly June Cleaver, but then you go on, and you also have been Shirley Partridge. And Uh, I remember Partridge from the Partridge family, and I really liked Shirley Partridge. She was cool. She let her her kids grow their hair long, and I thought that was neat, and that was something I couldn't do, but uh, she let her kids do, and she also played in a rock band with them, so she was a cool mom. But then I went on, and and I remembered Edith Bunker, and uh, Edith Bunker certainly was another different type of mom. She She was lovable, but she was out of it, and you know, she always would excuse her husband's political incorrectness with, Oh, Archie. And uh, then you go from Edith Bunker, and then you have Carol Brady. Now, Carol Brady was an interesting mom along the way in television because that was the first mom we really saw that had a blended family. And you, you know, it was yours, mine, and ours. And she always had just the right words to say in a very, very difficult situation. Really coming to another television mom, and this is my favorite mom of all television time, and that's Claire Huxtable. And uh, I just thought Claire was just a great mom. And, and I thought she was a great mom because she demonstrated always a great love, a romantic, playful love with her husband. She always had time for her kids. She was a professional, and uh, she, she just did everything. And certainly on the Cosbys, you could see that. But uh, then now we move into this century. And uh, now we have another mother that is on television, and uh, her name is Sharon Osbourne, and uh, on the Osbournes. And I, I just, I just want to, I just went to the web page of the television guide and pulled out what it said about this family. And here's, here's what it says. Foul mouth, erratic behavior, and too many pets for your own good. The new season of the Osbournes is now steamrolling to your tube. The Prince of Darkness, Ozzy Osbourne, and his mean wife, Sharon, and their kids are causing more Beverly Hills antics than the hillbillies, and we're throwing you back inside their home for more infighting, crack-ups, and pet fiascos. We say, blank the Cleavers, the Bradys, and the Cosbys. This is a real family, real and raw, just like yours. (laughs) What an insult to families today. What an unbelievable insult. So I was thinking, can you imagine somebody trying to really develop a life and trying to develop a definition of a family or a mom by watching the television today and certainly see how it's regressed? That's why I'm so thankful that in times like these, in our family series, we have the Word of God. Our vision statement says that we're a biblically-based global community of believers cooperating together by building, uh, glorifying Jesus Christ by building radical relationships for life. We're biblically based. So what does the Bible say about being a mom? Today we're going to take a look at example. The, her name is Hannah, and we're going to take a look at what it means to find the me in mommy. Now here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to take a slow walk with me down a country road. And as we walk, I'm gonna ask you to look at two signs today. And as I look at those two signs, I'm gonna ask you to really ask yourself or really allow the Holy Spirit to bear witness in your heart. 
On these two signposts that point to what it really means to be the me and mommy, where are you on that road? And if you find yourself moving in the wrong direction, remember we said there's two roads when we're building our families. There is a road that says the way home and there's a road that says away from home. One moves toward a biblical model, one moves away from a biblical model. And so with that in mind, let's look at this woman that we call Hannah, which her name means favored. You know, W.L. Caldwell said this, no nation is greater than its mothers for they are the makers of men. And I've noticed this also, whenever God wants to bring an impactful man or woman into this world or into whatever situation that is needful of it, he always uses a godly mother. Now, Hannah was certainly that example. She was a woman that had great turmoil in her own life. There was great turmoil in her family. There was also great turmoil in the nation of Israel at this time. They were moving further and further and further away from God's model in their life, and there was great turmoil. In the midst of this, God is going to raise up a prophet. His name is Samuel, and that prophet is going to be used of God, perhaps like no other prophet in all the Word of God. And so God is preparing this family for this moment, and he's going to use this godly mom named Hannah in this particular situation. Now, what do we know about Hannah? We know that she was married, but she wasn't married to the perfect husband. Matter of fact, I... I doubt if there's been any perfect husband, well, since Cynthia got married, but I don't, uh... <laughs> okay, that's weak, but I have the pulpit, so I can say, all right, but what do we know? What do we know about Hannah's husband? Listen to this. Look in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 2. His name was Elkanah. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other, Peniah. Peniah had children, but Hannah had none. He had two wives. You know what I love about the Bible? People always say, come on, keep it real. Come on, keep it real. Let me tell you something. The Bible always keeps it real. The Bible always tells you right, wrong. It always shows you in the lives of individuals that they're people just like us, that they experience trouble just like we did. Now, we look at that and we immediately realize this is nuts. This guy had two wives. Why did he have two wives? It, well, certainly God did not ordain polygamy. God never, God never ordained it. As a matter of fact, every time in the Bible where you see polygamy, you always see consequences, every time. But it was a cultural practice in this day. As a matter of fact, according to the cultural practice, if you married and your wife could not bear children for some reason, then they allowed you to take another wife so that children could be born into the family. And so in this situation, polygamy was allowed, but it certainly wasn't accepted, and there were consequences to it. It wasn't God's plan. But Elkanah was a good man. He did love the Lord, and he loved Hannah with all of his heart. And, and as a matter of fact, we find out that Hannah had a problem. We already talked about it. Hannah had the problem of infertility. Now, we talked about it a little bit, but let's drive home this point just a little bit right here. If you think about it, 16 out of every 100 families experience periods of infertility in their life. 16 out of every 100. Today in the United States, there are 9.2 million families that are in some type of infertility counseling or medical practices helping them. And so this is, this is obviously a problem, and it's a problem that is a, that is a real heartfelt problem. And those that have walked through these paths know the pain that is there. And so Hannah was a woman that had great pain. She not only dealt with the, uh, with the polygamy, she also dealt with the fact that there was infertility in her life. But even more than that, she also dealt with the fact that the other woman in her life was constantly harassing her. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, that Penia was provoking her making fun of her, throwing up to her the fact, look at my children, you don't have any. He loves me, look at my children, you don't have any. Constantly provoking her, and especially in times of worship. I've noticed that in times of worship, if the enemy can do anything at all to distract you or to target you or to come against you, he'll try to do that during times of worship. In the midst of this, there are two very visible signs in this passage of Scripture that are signs for every woman today. If we're talking about how do we put a biblical me and mommy, 
Then we begin, first of all, and if you're taking notes, write this down. Hannah was vertically focused. She was vertically focused. I want you to look at 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Look at this with me. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will, only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. Hannah was a woman that we would say was vertically focused in her personal relationship with God. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean that Hannah's, Hannah's first responsibility, this is a mom that recognized if I'm not vertically focused, if I'm not right with God, nothing else is going to be right in my life. And so I would ask you today, whether you're a, whether you're a wife or a mom or, 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 or whether you're planning to be at some point, let me ask you, if we walk down this road today, where would you be if I were to ask you today, are you vertically focused? What is your relationship to Jesus Christ right now? Now, be honest about it, because you see, there are some of you, if you're honest enough to walk down this country road, you're going to have to say, my life is not demonstrated by the fact that I am vertically focused in building a relationship with the Lord. My life is, is more visible, really walking away from a relationship with God. Now, moms, I want to ask you something. The whole purpose of a family series is to really try to build and strengthen the family. And so take that walk with me right now and ask yourself this question. Is there in my life evidence that I am a vertically focused woman? Now, what, what does that mean to be vertically focused? She was, first of all, vertically focused in her prayer life. She cried out to the Lord. As a matter of fact, in, in verse 10, it says, In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept and prayed before the Lord. The Bible says the Lord is near unto those with a broken heart and contrite spirit. And I want you to know that if you're a mom today, it's okay to be broken before the Lord. It's okay to weep. It's okay to cry. The Bible says that God sees every one of those tears. And the Word says the Lord is near unto those with a broken heart and contrite spirit. It's evidenced of her vertical focus by the fact that she, in the midst of her pain, cried out first to the Lord. She cried out first to the Lord. And she said, oh God, almighty, if you will, look upon your servant's misery and remember me. And not forget your servant, but give her a son, and I will give him to you all the days of your life. Now, the ultimate mom, the big me and mommy, as far as a biblical mom is concerned, begins right here. And so I would ask you, if you're looking for a manual for motherhood, you don't need to look any further than the Word of God. I, I really believe that the future of any nation rests upon a godly mom who is vertically focused. Now, dads, I know we play a real important part, and we're going to get to you a little later in this series. But I believe that, that really there, there was an ancient African proverb that says this, the ruin of a nation begins in the homes of its people. And so we ask ourselves this question. Maybe today you're complaining about the way America is or complaining about what's going on in our society. I want to ask you a question. First of all, what's going on in your home? Are you a godly mom? Are you vertically focused? Is that vertical focus evidenced in your prayer life? And if you look at that prayer closely, you're going to see something that is really interesting. There was, there was first of all, surrender in her heart. Listen to this. O oh Lord Almighty, if you will. Now, do you know what if you will says? It says, Lord, I'm crying out to you in my heart. This is, this is the desire of my heart, but I want you to know that I am submitting to your perfect will. And I want you to know, Lord, that I am crying out to you, and I would love for you to bless my womb with a child. I would love that. That's a desire of my heart. But God, more than anything else, I'm telling you right now, if you will, it's your will. And so I would ask you in your prayer life, is that vertical focus of your prayer life evidenced by your submission to the Lord? 
where you're able to say, God, your will, not mine. It's not only her life that was submitted in her prayer life, it, there was also sacrificial. She said, Lord, I, I, I want to make a vow to you. And folks, the Bible says it's better for you to never to make a vow than to make a vow and not honor it to the Lord. And she says, here's my vow to you, Lord. My heart is submitted to you. It's your will. Your will be done. But I want to tell you something, Lord. This isn't bargaining with you. This is my heart. I am willing, God, if you will bless my life with a child, I will surrender him to you. And Lord, I'll give him to you, and you use him all the days of his life. Wow, what a mother. What an unbelievable mom. Her vertical focus involved not only her vertical focus in prayer, but also her vertical focus in the promise of her life that said, Lord, your will be done. She was able to know my peace is going to be in the center of God's will. It was Dante that said, in his will is your peace. I think it's interesting that even, even the son's name that was born to her, Samuel, if you look at it in the Hebrew language, uh, you break it up into three different parts. Sa'am means ask, and uh, Sama heard, and El, God. So you put his name together, Samuel, and it means I ask and I was heard by God, and this is God's gift, this son. Even his son was evidence that this is a woman that had a great vertical focus. And so I want to ask you today. Now, I really, I really am serious. I want to ask you in the presence of the Lord today, those of you that are watching by webcast and those of you that are here today, I want you to take a very slow walk and to walk right down this road. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I vertically focused in my relationship with the Lord? Is it evidenced by my prayer life that has both my submission of my spirit and, and my sacrifice to the Lord? Is it evidenced by my promise to the Lord to live for him and to honor him? If it's not, then this is a message for you. This is a word for you today. This is what God's saying. We do a family series not just to have fun. We're going to do that. That's a byproduct. We do a family series so we can open the word and say, is my life in alignment with God's word? And so that's the question. The interesting fact is she was not only vertically focused in her relationship with God, but also she was a woman that was horizontally faithful. She was horizontally faithful. Now, I want you, I want you to look at that for just a moment. And what does that mean to be horizontally faithful? It means that she had that first part of that country road down perfect. She was vertically focused. But as a result of her relationship with God, it literally then began to impact every other relationship in her life. That's a great test. If we are right with God vertically, then we're going to have our horizontal relationships to be right as well. I want you to look now in 1 Samuel chapter 1 again. Look in verse 3. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Phinehas and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. And the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. What do we know about this? We know by that particular passage of Scripture that not only was this a mother in the home that was vertically focused, but this was a woman that had a horizontal relationship with her husband that was a great relationship. You see it evidenced in Elkanah's response to her. He realized that his wife was hurting. He understood her need. 
And the word says that he would give extra time to her, that he would give a double portion to her. Later on, he would try to comfort her in the midst of her infertility and say, remember my love to you. Remember how strong my love is to you. But what an amazing, beautiful picture this is that you see, first of all, the vertical focus, then the horizontal relationship. Now, let me tell you something, ladies. This is really important. In the horizontal relationship, Next to your vertical focus, the very first emphasis and priority of your life in that horizontal relationship is your husband. Now, I always want to say that because we live in a culture today that is really child-centered. And I'm so thankful for our children. I'm so thankful. But I want you to know if we're keeping it real today, and we're following a biblical pattern and a biblical model, every mom here needs to recognize this. If you're vertically focused in your right relationship with the Lord, that first primary responsibility of that horizontal relationship, being horizontally faithful, means your faithfulness to your husband. And then comes that relationship to the kids. Now I want to ask you a question. Why is that important? How do your kids learn what they need to know about life. I want to remind you that in our home, values are far more caught than they are taught. Far more. What are you going to teach your children about reconciliation if you and your husband are not on that right relationship together? What are you going to teach your children about love? What are you going to teach your children about forgiveness? What are you going to teach your children about relationships to one another? What are you going to teach your children about the importance of the local church? What are you going to teach your children about about your faith in the Lord? You see, our children are watching every aspect of our lives. And I I just want want to tell you in love that if in your home, your home is centered around that child, then you're teaching that child there's nothing more important in life than me. And if that child grows up and centers his whole life around himself, he's not only going to have problems spiritually or she, but they're also going to have problems in their relationships because everything is about them. And so Hannah was horizontally faithful. But you know what? What I love about this? They worship together. I want to commend the dads that are here today worshiping with your families. I think that is so vitally important that your children see that you are a family that worships together. And I also want to say one word. I'm going to depart here for just a second. I want to say one word to our single adults and to our students that are here today. There is a biblical model for marriage. There's a biblical model for preparing for marriage. And that biblical model says that you prayerfully open your heart and your eyes and you wait for somebody that is going to be equally yoked with you. What does that mean, equally yoked? It means somebody that shares your convictions that Jesus Christ is Lord. Somebody that is on the same level as you spiritually. Now, I want to I tell you one thing. I want you to walk right over here down the country road with me. And I want you to know that there are a lot of families today who came right here in marriage. And they knew that their husband or their wife was not a believer. And what they did right here, they absolutely, even though they knew what God's word said about being equally yoked, they released that word in order to walk in their own way because they said this, you know what? That's okay. God will make a difference right here. God will understand. Or I'll lead her to the Lord or I'll lead him to the Lord. And so what did they do? They came right here to the point of conviction and they walked away from God's presence. And time and time and time again, you find one situation after another where there is such great strife and difficulty because they're not equally yoked. Hannah and her husband worshiped together. They had that in common. She was a woman that was vertically focused. 
She was horizontally faithful. God led her to a man that according to scriptures, he was a man of God. Look in verse 3, year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. He was a provider for his family. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Phinehas, to her sons and daughters, but Hannah would get double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. He was also a man with an understanding spirit. He would speak gently to his wife and say, I know you're broken, but remember my love for you. And so I just want to share that with you. Now, Hannah had the relationship right with God. She had the relationship right with her husband. But then what else was right? Do you know what she did? She did three things as a mom that are essential. First of all, she prayed for her children. Now, let me ask you, moms, are you praying for your children? And I want to talk to you, if, if you're like Cynthia and I and you have adult children, you ought, to, you ought to never quit praying for your children. We ought to pray for them every day as long as we're alive. They're still our children, even though they're adults. The Word says she prayed for her children. Secondly, do you know what Hannah did? She prepared her children. I want you to look in verse 20 and 23 right here for just a moment. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. When the man Elkanah went up with his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said instead to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. And so here was a mom that prayed for her kids. Here was a mom that prepared her children. She prepared them for the future. If you know anything about child psychology, you know what they say. They say that a child's moral value or character is developed from age one to eight. One to eight, how important that time is. When they're preschoolers, when they're early in our home, that's when that character is developed. The Word says Hannah prayed for her kids, she prepared her kids. But then she did something else. She was able to present her kids to the Lord. Wow, what does that mean, presenting your kids to the Lord? Look at this passage of Scripture in verse 24. After she weaned, after he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with three-year-old bull, an ephah of a flower, and a skin of wine, and brought him into the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, as surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for the child, and the Lord granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Wow. Do you know what else this godly mom did? She released her children. She released her children to the Lord. Now, I want to tell you something that I think is one of the most difficult things to do in life as a parent, and that is to trust the Lord enough to be able to release your children to his care. And that's a process, folks. The first time you and your husband get a babysitter, and you're going to leave that baby alone. You know what? That is a time when you're going to have to trust the Lord and release that child. Their first day of school, how anxious we as parents were on that first day, or some of you will be, when you take that son or that daughter and release them there that first day of school. Their first date, 
when you see them go off. And as a father, you're saying, I told her it was 32 before she could go, and she went anyway at 16. When they go to college, some of you parents are facing that. And I want to tell you, that's another time in which your heart will be tugged and, and you'll feel that and you'll want, take one more step and say, all right, Lord, I trust you. I release my son to you. I release my daughter to you. When they get married, you know it is a healthy family who has learned what it means to trust the Lord enough to release your children to them. And so you come to this place and you go, all right. Here's a, here's a pretty simple illustration looking at the life of Hannah. She was, she was vertically focused. She was a woman of God. She knew the value of prayer. And she prayed for her kids. She was horizontally faithful. In spite of of great difficulty in that marriage, having to, having to deal with the, with the pain of infertility, having to deal with a rival, another woman, and yet she remained faithful. And God honored her. God granted the desire of her heart. She prayed for her kids. She prepared her kids. She presented her kids to the Lord. At a time when Israel desperately needed leadership, God used a godly woman to prepare a young boy by the name of Samuel that would be God's prophet for that day. And so, walk with me. This is pretty simple. You don't have to be a genius to figure this one out. It's a simple yes or no. In walking down this country road, and you stop right here, ask yourself this question, am I vertically focused? Some of you today don't even have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have religion, but you've never had a personal relationship. And right now, today, God is saying, I want you this day to give your life to Christ. I want you to be honest enough to say, I need the Lord. And let me tell you something. If you're a mom, your kids need to know that you value eternity. Because I want to tell you something, mom and dad, if you don't value eternity, then you're taking the most important possession you have of a child's soul, and you're just throwing that to chance. So if you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, today is the day for you to do that. Maybe you are a Christian, but you say, you know what? If I'm walking down that country road and I'm honest, I need to renew my vertical focus. I've really gotten away from what it means to be a godly woman. Today is that day. What about your horizontal relationships? Maybe you'd say today, you know what? Things aren't the way they need to be in marriage. It's not what it needs to be with my kids right now. And if I'm honest walking down that country road, I would have to say that we are moving away from home, not to home. Today's a great opportunity to say, you know what? God used this message to touch my life and to touch my heart. And I'm going to trust him to make a difference today. Would you bow your head with me in prayer?